is to formally request that the uh, the webcast is started. So uh, that'll be um, that is that is that Becky? I take it. Uh, yep, yeah, it's now started. Yes. Now started. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. OK, so I've got to make an official announcement, everybody. And just to let you all know that this briefing is being webcast on YouTube via the County Council website. So I presume I have to say things like you agree to having your image recorded uh, if you if you're uh, if you're here with us this morning. So good morning, members, and thank you for attending. Um, I'd especially like to to welcome all the uh, all the new members, not just to new members to this committee, but the new members to the county council. But also, of course, a warm welcome to uh, to all of you who have been members for uh, for probably longer than me, and welcome back to the ETE Select Committee. Uh, those who are not new to the committee will have noticed the uh, the somewhat different uh, agenda format this morning, and uh, you'll notice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's no. There's no apologies and no minutes uh, of the last meeting, but those will return when we uh, when we have our next and first formal meeting, which will be in July. I'll say a little bit more about that that later on. Uh, so instead, this meeting uh, is being presented as an informal briefing, and as such, it doesn't require us, as you've already gathered, to be meeting in person. Shortly, Katie will be giving you a presentation on governance. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, both new and uh, and experienced members will uh, will find this extremely helpful. After Katie's presentation, we'll be hearing from senior managers across the ETE uh, departments, and they'll be giving us an overview of the functions uh, of their sections. And this will give you also members an opportunity to ask any questions at that time. Finally, this morning, we will be uh, looking at the committee's work program. Uh, and uh, following the elections, uh, this is a brand new committee. Uh, so what I wanted to do was give you all the opportunity to contribute to the work programme. So we'll start with a, a clean slate. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this when we come to item four on, on the agenda. So before I invite Katie to, uh, to, to give her presentation on governance, I thought it might be nice if we just go round the, uh, the, the virtual table, if I can put it that way, and invite each of you to, uh, to to perhaps say a few things about about yourselves. Uh, that will only be members, by the way, of the of the select committee, if that's okay. Because I know uh, and and executive members, obviously, uh, there there may well be other members on this call. I can't see all of you uh, on my screen. I can only see a few of you. So this might be a little bit messy. So do, please do bear with me. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go through the uh, the list I have of members of the select committee. I'm going to invite each member of that select committee in turn to say a few things about themselves if they want to. If they don't want to, they don't have to. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to invite the executive members who are here. If the executive members would like to say anything, uh, I, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to say ladies first. So Jan, would you like to uh, to go first? Yes. Um... Good morning, everybody. I'm um, Councillor Jan Warwick. Um, this is my second term um, as an elected councillor, and I represent the area of Winchester Downlands. I'm a pharmacist by profession, but I now have the um, portfolio for climate change and sustainability. So thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Jan. OK, uh, Russell, I can see that you are here. I don't know where the Rob is, but I'm going to invite me. Russell, if you could go next. Hello, I'm Russell Oppenheimer. I'm the County Councillor for Petersfield Hangers, uh, one of two County Councillors for Petersfield. And uh, I'm the Executive Member for Highways Operations. Um, in previous jobs, I've worked in the civil service, in commodities trading and retail. So a varied career and look forward to working with all of you uh, in attending this committee. Thanks a lot, Chairman. Thank you very much, Russell. Now, uh, I've managed to probably upset him already because the deputy leader I can see at the bottom of my screen is here, So, uh, and I've left him till last. But actually, Rob, best till last as the executive member. Absolutely. First of all, congratulations to be elected as chairman of the select committee. I do apologise for being late. I was actually on a call uh, with the leader trying to sort out some other issues. So apologies uh, for that. But as you've heard with the two new exec members, I'm the 
what they call now the lead member for ETE. So everything that Jan and Russell said they're doing, everything that's left, uh, I will be doing and, and overseeing some of some of the work that they're doing as well. So uh, I'll let you carry on with your meeting, Chairman, just to say uh, congratulations uh, to you on your chairmanship and to the team. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Rob, and, uh, and welcome to the ETE meeting. Um, OK, now I'm going to go through uh, members, although I don't know if all of all of the uh, people I have on my list are here. We'll find out as we go through the list. So I'm going to start with um, in. Well, I'm going to go in alphabetical order, I think, if I've got mm -hmm. that right. Uh, we'll start with uh, Nick. Nick, uh, Nick Adams King. Are you here? I am here, uh, Stephen. Yeah, and I'm always first <laughs> with my surname. Um, uh, hello, I'm Nick Adams King. I'm a newly elected member. Um, I represent Romsey Rural. Uh, so it runs from Chilworth all the way up to West Hitherley on the uh, uh, on the Wiltshire border. Um, by profession, I'm a charter surveyor, um, but uh, I'm also a double hatter. So I'm the deputy leader of Test Valley Borough Council, and uh, my portfolio there is planning and transport. And transport in Test Valley means car parks, really, um, but also a few other bits and pieces like community transport and so on. So I'm looking forward to the, sitting on this committee. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, and welcome. Uh, next, uh, if I'm probably going to go out of order here somewhere along the line, so please do bear with me. I have Debbie Kerno Ford. Debbie, are you here? I don't think Debbie's joined us just yet, Chairman. That's fair, that's fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on then. Uh, now, Barry Dunning, I know you are here. Barry, good morning. Good morning. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Barry Dunning. I'm the uh, newly elected um, member for Lymington and Boulder. Um, previous experience, I've been on Lymington and Pennington Town Council now for seven years. And um, I'm also on NFDC um, as member for um, Lymington and Pennington. Uh, mustn't forget Pennington. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, working with you all over the next four years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, and welcome. Uh, next, uh, next, I have Tim Groves. Tim, are you here this morning? Yes, I am here. Yes, and uh, nice to meet you all. I, I'm uh, the new member for Chalmers Ford. Um, I have a professional background in highways and transportation, so and, and a, a chartered highway engineer. Um, and I'm also on Eastleigh Borough Council and have been for a couple of years. So that's my background. Good, good to meet you all. Thank you, and you too. Thank you very much, Tim. Welcome. Uh, Gary Hughes. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, Councillor Gary Hughes, I am the county representative for Purbrook and Stake South, which is over to the east of Hampshire. Uh, for those who don't come to uh, the atrium very frequently, uh, I'm also a dual hatter. I'm in my seventh year as a, a borough councillor on Havant, and I'm in, just started my second term uh, on Hampshire County County, and I'm delighted to still be participating in this particular select committee. Thank you very much, Gary. You're welcome, welcome, very welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Rupert uh, Kyle. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members. Um, yeah, it's Rupert Kyle, um, re-elected to uh, represent Botley and Hedgehen North in Eastleigh. Um, I've been on the County Council for a little while and also, um, as other members will know who have been on here before, obviously I've been on the ETE committee for a while. Uh, passionate about all things to do with the environment, waste and recycling, etc. I'm also a dual hatter. Um, uh, I've been on the EC Borough Council since 2002 um, and various parish and town councils. Um, and uh, I'm also um, a cabinet member for the environment for EC Borough Council. Thank you very much indeed, Rupert. Welcome back and uh, I'm looking forward to working with you. Hugh Lumbey. Uh, blind oh Hugh, you're very you're very quiet. Can can everybody can anybody else uh, is anybody else having difficulty hearing you? I'm getting some nods. He's very quiet. <laughs> He's very quiet. <laughs> Which is very out of character. Unlike Martin, yeah. Can you, can I can it, just it, I can just about hear you. Is that a bit clearer? I don't know what I have to do. I I turned the volume up. No, I can hear you, but if you carry on, that's right. We'll bear with we'll bear with you. Go on. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll I'll do this using the power of mime rather than uh, <laughs> rather than rather than words. That may be more helpful. Um, my name's Hugh Lumby. I am uh, the new elected member for the Meon Valley uh, Division uh, within the Winchester um, City District. Um, I'm also a dual hatter. I'm sitting on Winchester City Council. 
Uh, by background, um, I am a solicitor, worked for 30 years in the city, focusing on commercial property and regeneration. And um, I regularly received emails addressed to dear Councillor Humby. Um, sometimes I get interesting correspondence by mistake. Usually I just get confused with my my um, more of the more esteemed next door neighbour. So looking forward to working with the committee and you too, Chair. Thank you very much, Hugh. I'm ever so pleased you pointed that out because I can see that can uh, that's going to be a problem over the next. <laughs> <point>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ka Welcome, Councillor Councillor Elaine Still. Elaine, hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, Elaine Still. Um, I was first selected to the County Council in 2005, so I've been around a long time. <laughs> uh, my division is the Loddon Division, which is to the north. Um, yeah, to the north of Hampshire, so Bas uh, Basingstoke area, basically. But it's a nice division because I've got semi-rural and rural, and I'm very passionate about the environment too, hence why I'm on the committee. I sat on the committee several years ago, so uh, I've got some idea of how it operates. OK. Thank you very much. In which case, welcome back, Elaine. Nice to see you. Uh, next, I have Kim Taylor. Kim, are you with us this morning? Uh, good morning, Chair, and uh, hello, members. I'm the newly elected member for Basingstoke Central, so right in the heart of Basingstoke, uh, with most of the things that happen to be going going on and affecting us in regarding transport, environment, highways, all those sorts of things. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, and very very warm welcome to you, Martin Todd. Hi, I'm Martin Todd. I'm uh, the County Councillor for Winchester Westgate, have been since 2013. Um, this is my second time uh, on the Environment, Transport and Economy Committee. Like some others, I'm also a, a double hatter um, and I'm the Cabinet Member responsible for a pretty similar mix of things at Winchester City Council. Um, Cabinet Member for Regeneration, but it also includes uh, recycling, transport and the economy. Thank recovery you. actually, so cabinet member for recovery, not regeneration. Always forget that. Thank you very much, Martin. Yes, you've too many titles there, I think. <laughs> Thank you, well, and welcome back. And uh, in the absence of Bill Withers this morning, the final member on my list is Ridian Vaughan. Ridian, good morning. <laughs> oh no, I know Derek. Don't worry, you're coming. You're coming next because you're you're, you're 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 my vice chairman. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten you. Ridian, good morning. Are you here? I think uh, I think uh, Councillor Vaughan's just dropped off for a moment. Okay. Um, okay. In which case, we'll we'll just go to Derek then. Derek, yes, I know. Sorry, I was gonna. I I hadn't forgotten you, honestly. Well, no, it's OK, uh, Chair, having been called David repeatedly over the last couple of months for some reason. It's nice to see now that M comes after V in your alphabetical order. Um, I'm Derek Meller. I'm the I've been I've just started my second term as a county councillor uh, representing Tadley Borkhurst and all the villages that go in and out of Berkshire. Um, before moving into uh, the local political scene, I spent 38 years in transport and operations, of which 37 of those years were in aviation, which I know must please all the environmentalists no end. Um, I'm also a double hatter, probably more by luck than judgment, as I represent Tadley and Pamba on Basingstoke and Dean, and have done for a long time, well, approximately six weeks. Uh, and indeed, it's my pleasure to be the deputy uh, to uh, Stephen. So that's all about me. Thank you, Derek. It, it wasn't it wasn't a snub leaving you to last. I think. <laughs> OK, if we don't have Ridian with us, uh, uh, if hopefully he will be able to join us at some at some point the, this morning uh, or rejoin us, perhaps, because I think he was here earlier on. And um, I think we can then move on to item two on the, this, uh, the agenda this morning, and that is a presentation by Katie. Katie Sherwood, who's going to say a few things about uh, about the governance of, uh, of the select committees, in, I think, in general, and possibly more specifically ETE. Katie, over to you. Thank you. I'll just load up my presentation. OK, can you all see that OK? Oh, can you hear me? 
Yes, yeah. sorry, I'm just telling oh. you. Yes, I can. No, that's all right. Oh, I had a sudden panic then. I've been completely cut off. <laughs> Right, OK, I'll just get started. So obviously these slides are also on the on, on the ModGov and the website as well. So I, I won't read them at you. I'll just try and give you a brief summary of each one. Um, and then obviously you can just have a look as we go through. Um, so, yeah, so I'm Katie Sherwood for those who um, haven't met me before. And I look after the um, ET Select Committee. So just to give you a little bit of background to um, to scrutiny. Um, so obviously it was it was introduced um, following the Local Government Act in, in 2000 um, and the Hampshire County Council actually has um, five select committees. So obviously there's this one. There is also children and young people, culture and communities, uh, policy and resource with, resources, which has the, um, the chairman of the other select committees on it. And also health and adult social care, um, HASC, which is, is, is more widely known as. Um, the select committees generally meet four times a year, but obviously they do have the ability to to add extra meetings um, as and when as and when necessary. Um, so just skip on to the role and the purpose of scrutiny. So just a bit of a summary here. So as you can see, the remit um, is, is quite broad, so it, it can involve making recommendations um, and also doing research and things like that. So there's quite an, a, a good scope there. Um, sorry, there's a lot of text on this slide, so I don't expect you to read it all now. <laughs> so the terms of reference for the um, for the select committee, um, this is actually in part two, chapter five of the Constitution. If you did fancy a bit of a light-hearted reading on on that on that bit, um, so yes, yeah, so it's actually. Um, the key executive members are the lead member for economy, transport and environment, uh, highways operations and executive member for climate change and sustainability. So that's just kind of the, the remit of the committee committee there. Um, this slide has just a bit about um, holding the executive and the council to account. Um, so it's obviously done through um, pre-scrutiny, which is when things are kind of looked at in advance. Um, and then there's also um, the call-in procedure, which is which is there. Um, it's very rare. I'm, I've personally not been involved in a call-in myself, but um, that's the ability to call in a decision. Um, and then also there's the ability to review decisions that have been made. Um, and as it says, as part of a rider review of, of policy or to, to see how, how that's going ahead. Um, scrutiny of decisions. So this just gives you um, an idea of kind of questions to consider um, when scrutinising decisions um, and just a good way of finding a constructive way, way forward, really, as a committee. Um, and then we've got a bit more about the call in process. Um, it, um, the call in process starts from uh, five days. It's, it's five days after an email is sent out and after decisions are made, you will receive an email that confirms that decisions have been made and that starts the five working days call in period. Um, a quorum, when it refers to um, a quorum of members, is actually a quarter of the committee um, or three, which, whichever number is the greatest. So obviously that applies to all committees, so it depends on the size of the committee. So it's either a quarter or if it's a smaller committee, it's three. Um, call in options. So yeah, so the committee must decide whether or not to recommend that the decision is to be reconsidered or um, whether the decision is not in line with the policy or budget framework that the county council should take that decision. So that's just a bit about um, what would happen as part of calling in a decision. And then the effect of call in. Um, and it mentions uh, urgent key decisions um, that on cannot be called in. So if something is is really is a, is an urgent key decision, then it would have to be um, taken with approval of the select committee chairman, um, and in by giving that approval, it kind of waivers the call in um, period because obviously it's a decision that needs to be taken um, and, and potentially implemented quite urgently. So um, a bit of a summary on policy development and review. Um, and again, it just gives some questions to consider um, as part of doing that. And also it mentions how 
you know, you can look at current, um, anything current, any current policies and things in place, as well as anything kind of coming up in the future um, to look at how that might work going forward. Um, working groups. So it's um, it's not uncommon for for smaller groups to be to be formed, um, made up of select committee members. Um, so this might be um, to focus on something like I think we've had groups on like the cycling walking strategies and things like that. So it's just an opportunity for a smaller group of members to to take something away and focus on on that a bit more. And and then they would kind of bring reports like update reports back to the main select committee. Items for the agenda. Um, so again, this is another reference to the Constitution. This is in Part 3, Chapter 3. Um, so this is how, I, um, about how items kind of can be discussed and made their way onto an agenda. Um, it might be that they come up as part of the work programme item, which is on every select committee meeting agenda, um, or they can be sent to, to us at any time. And it's, it might be that the, the chairman discusses um, appropriate timescales with the director, um, depending on what the item is. Um, so it might be that we have a look at the best kind of time of time of year or how long we want to, to give before we look at a particular item that's coming up. Um, and again, um, a bit more about topic suggestions. Um, and that there also is the um, option to put things on the member briefing program, which happens monthly as well. So if it's something that you feel is an information item that might be um, of interest to, to, to more members outside of the select committee, then sometimes it's something that's referred on to the member briefing program. Um, and then all members can be briefed that way. So we have a, um, well, we will have a rolling work programme, which we're going to discuss today. Um, as the chairman said, we're going to start afresh. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we will look at timescales um, for items and, and kind of have a discussion as to when it might be a good time to put um, a particular item on the work program. So the work program will cover kind of the next, it normally covers like the next three or four meetings, upcoming meetings, um, and then each meeting um, will be able to look at that and review, see what's coming up, um, timescales, and then we'll be able to have a, a list of items that maybe haven't been allocated yet to a particular meeting. Okay, what will success look like? Um, so yeah, so this is just a a little bit about um, how we can measure success as a select committee um, and obviously just getting the most out of the meetings and the topics that come come to the meetings. Um, and then just a, a bit of a conclusion, um, just a conclusion there on the slides. Obviously, I'm around any time. If anyone has any questions, I think it's a sort of area governance where you kind of think of things as the year progresses and as they crop up, you might um, think of things. So obviously, I'm happy to answer any questions now or feel free to, to get in touch any time about anything as and when. Um, and there, then, that's me. Katie, thank you very much indeed for that. That's uh, that was very useful. Um, uh, now, members, have, uh, has anyone got any questions at all for uh, for Katie on her on her presentation on governance? Uh, Ridian, I can see you've got your hand up there. You'd like to go first? Well, no, it's just it's just to apologise. My system's all blew up, and so I I've, I've been away for about five minutes. Actually, before you ask ask your question, then Ridian, we we went round the uh, the members in advance of uh, of Katie's presentation, offering them the opportunity to say a few things about themselves if they wanted to and introduce themselves. Would you like to do that first before you? Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, Ridian Vaughan. I'm in my second term as the member for the Caliber Division, that is north of Basingstoke in the nice green fluffy villages, and named after the wonderful Roman town of Caliber in Silchester. Uh, we do have roads up here, uh, but whenever I ask for money, they, I'm told that they're Roman roads and they'll last forever, which is hardly helpful. <laughs> um, and I, I've just been elected as chairman of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Authority. There you go. And I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say welcome me back. <laughs> oh, OK. No, no. Well, thank you very much for that. Great. Does anybody have a question for, for Katie? 
Chairman, not that I'm trying to defer any questions, but I was just going to um, to flag up that we have actually had two two deputies um, join us as well, Councillor Crawford and Councillor Wade. Oh, OK. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for that. I would I didn't know. I was unaware. In that case, uh, yes, um, Councillor Crawford, yeah, we'll go with Councillor Crawford first. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman. I'd just like to say I'm representing the Aldershot North Division and uh, of course we have many uh, uh, traffic problems up here and uh, so that's why I'm very interested to find out about the uh, role of the scrutiny panel this morning and uh, I'm very interested to hear what uh, comes up next on the agenda. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us this morning. I know you're only a, a second, only a deputy. Deputies are very important, but being a deputy, that uh, that you know, it's it's easy to think that you can skip it. But uh, you're here this morning, and thank you very much for your attendance and your interest in that. Uh, Councillor Wade, Councillor Wade, we know one another. <laughs> Would you like to go next? Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I'm Councillor Malcolm Wade. I represent Hive and Dibden, where the forest meets the sea. I've uh, been on this council since 2013. I'm the Triple Hatted. I also sit on New Forest District Council and, and uh, Hive and Dibden Parish Council. Uh, and my business, my career was senior management in shipping and in uh, high tech manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, that's all of the uh, deputies that are with us this morning, isn't it, Katie? Yes, that's right. Yes. Thank you very much. OK, there appear to be no questions, uh, members, so we can then move on to item three. Now, this is where I defer to uh, to the uh, to section heads. So I don't know who wants to go first. I imagine, Stuart, you're going to be orchestrating the uh, the presentation. So I hand over to you, Stuart Jarvis. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. Um, good morning, members. And uh, that just begin with, um, I'll just introduce myself, and my role really is to introduce my colleagues who are going to take you through a short presentation about the main service areas um, in the Economy, Transport and Environment Department. Um, for those that haven't met me before, I'm Stuart Jarvis, the Director of Economy, Transport and Environment at Hampshire County Council, um, and I joined Hampshire County Council in 2004, so I'm still considered to be fairly new, I think, to Hampshire County Council, who have a tradition of very long service from, um, from officers. Um, prior to that, I, I worked in Somerset. I've also worked for Southampton City Council, Dudley Metropolitan Borough, and I spent 10 years working in West Wales for Pembrokeshire County Council and um, the North Pembrokeshire District Council before that. So a fairly wide variety of local government experience. Hampshire is the best place that I've ever worked and it's the best organisation I've ever worked for. Um, just uh, to say um, very briefly, that um, obviously the department covers a very wide range of services and we couldn't possibly do justice um, to all of that um, in a short presentation. So each of my assistant directors is going to give you um, four slides on the kind of scope and issues in their area. The chairman has already indicated, I think, that there's be an opportunity for questions and again, and Chairman, I, I think we agreed that um, there could be some questions after each presentation and then possibly more of a plenary session at the end, if that would be helpful, because I think, you know, the, the overlaps between these areas are, are likely to throw up things that um, might might provoke further questions. Um, I understand that someone is going to share um, the slide presentation. So, Casey, are you going to? Brilliant. And right on cue as well. Thank you, Katie. Excellent. If you can just hold it on that side for a second. So I, my, my final role, Stephen, other than being available to help out, answer any questions and so on, particularly in the plenary at the end, if that would be helpful to the committee, um, it's just really to introduce my assistant directors, and this is the order that they're going to speak in. So initially, Richard Kenny will start off with a presentation about the Economic Development Service at the County Council. And I'll be followed by Keith Wilcox, who's going to talk about the transport services. James Potter, who will talk about waste planning and environment. Um, and I have a, a, to pass on an apology from Tim Lawton, who can't join us today, but he's very... Um, ably uh, going to be re um, replaced by Stuart Giddings, who's the kind of head of the 
Highways Headquarters Highway Commissioning Team. So one of Tim's um, two deputies and Stuart will take you through the Highways presentation. So Gemma, without further ado, if it's okay with you, I'll pass over to Richard and we're hoping to keep the presentations fairly punchy. Four slides about to 10 to 12 minutes each, so there's plenty of time for questions afterwards. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Stuart. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, de de delighted to be here this morning. Um, as, as has been said, I'm Richard Kenny. I'm the um, Interim Assistant Director for uh, Economic Development. Um, just, just by way of background, uh, just, just, just some quick highlights. I've previously worked, for, worked on the regeneration of uh, the cities of both Manchester and Birmingham, and I've also worked on the Grenfell recovery. So the COVID recovery was was not my first um, sort of experience of that that kind of crisis. Um, and I've also worked on the West Midlands devolution arrangements um, and 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 uh, worked to 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 put in the the new directly elected mayoral system for the West Midlands and the um, the work that's being done there to enable the West Midlands to speak with a with a single voice. Just before joining Hampshire, which I joined uh, at the beginning of this year in January, I was the Director of Growth Planning Environment at Lancashire County Council, so I have some experience of, um, of two-tier local governments. Um, this first slide, I just think I want to just draw out three key points really. Point number one, I think um, it's really important to recognise right at the outset that a strong economy um, is fundamental to the future of local government. Um, these things are not separate from each other. Um, a strong economy, an inclusive economy, reduces demand on public services. Um, and, and I think that's really key to recognise um, for the local authority moving forwards, because the, the economic agenda, the place agenda, and the outward facing approach in terms of attracting investment, in terms of um, growing the economy, in being able to borrow against future growth to invest in Hampshire is very, very important. Um, so that's my first key point. And then I think the second key point that comes out from this slide is that Hampshire is an economic powerhouse. And I think that's something that perhaps Hampshire doesn't really say as often as, as perhaps it could. And it's interesting that if you, if you put the scale of the Hampshire economy, its assets and its sectors and everything else uh, in the league table of combined authorities, it would actually be uh, in, in, in and around fourth position, you know, not 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 taking account of London. So I think um, it's really important right at the outset too to recognise um, the scale of the economy and 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 the strength of the economy that that, that we have in Hampshire, and we're blessed um, and to have that and to work with that moving forwards. And then the third thing I want to say um, is that um, the, there's some mention here made about how important the tourism sector is, um, but it isn't just about tourism. Um, it's about all sectors. And I don't know if any of you were fortunate enough to be able to listen to the launch yesterday of the Hampshire 2050 story. Um, but that launch um, is available um, online and it's very worth um, taking a look because it visually um, and very eloquently um, uh, outlines and identifies the key sectors, you know, marine and maritime, aerospace, high tech, uh, side tech and digital and so on, and, and the scale of the assets that we have in terms of um, the ports and, and, and everything else. So I think I think that's something that that, that we that we need to recognise moving forwards. Um, next slide, please. Could somebody move the slide on, please? Sorry, Richard. Yeah, I'm just trying to um, move it on. Ah, there we are. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. So, so the the structure of the existing team um, it, it's broken into in, into five key um, five key areas. The um, the business the economic business development uh, team is actually the, the the business intelligence team and 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 that basically provides uh, a lot of the analysis and and data um, that, that that we use to as an evidence base to to you know build all our cases and bids to government and so on and that that team actually brings in commercial income because it does a lot of work for key partners across uh, across Hampshire including the local enterprise partnerships 
and indeed some of the district local authorities and some of the unitary local authorities as well. Um, it's a real key asset for us moving forwards um, and, and will position us very well in terms of um, in terms of our future case making role. The business support section, which is which is um, led by Michelle Morley, is um, look, looks at the key sectors. It looks at looks at our key assets and 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 works up um, key propositions uh, in in relation to those. Um, and it's also been do, doing work in terms of economic recovery and and post Brexit issues. Then there's the regeneration team that looks at um, uh, the, the 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 aspirations of the of the districts and the town centres and the high streets and supports those developments in various different ways and often wor works to coordinate across the county council um, the various different contributions that need to be made to make regeneration work for those for those areas. Um, we also have a, a Brussels office, um, which is still, despite Brexit, um, still in place. But it's um, it's basically there to 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 still uh, draw out uh, collaborative work with our European partners uh, and bids for you know uh, against particular funding streams. And recently has put a bid in against the Interreg program. And then there's the tourism sector that looks after the uh, Visit Hampshire website and the visitor economy. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, it's a relatively small team um, in comparison to the other teams. Um, small number of staff, and 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 you know, quite you know, obviously quite a small budget as a result of that. Um, nevertheless, the the key thing to the economic development team is the way that it works, and it works to to steer, to facilitate, to enable, to collaborate. Um, to work across the whole system, to work with other partners, um, to, to to strengthen the economy, and I think sometimes, you know, the key thing for us moving forwards is is all about, you know, summing the parts to 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 make a, a bigger difference at scale and and make the whole bigger than those parts. Um, final slide, please. And then just just to mention a, a, a couple of um, a couple of the current key issues that we're we're working on. Um, economic recovery, obviously, in relation to the pandemic, um, you know, Hampshire was hit very hard, particularly in the early stages, but it's but tending to, to recover faster. Um, an economic growth strategy, I think there's real opportunities for us moving forwards in terms of, um, in, in terms of providing a strategy for Hampshire, pan Hampshire move, moving forwards, particularly in light of the um, the demise of the local industrial strategies. So I think I think there's a space there for us to 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 work work more coherently across across the piece and to take uh, advantage of the 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 opportunities that arise in relation to national government and uh, you know possibly working you know working to secure more resources in collaboration at, at different levels of scale. Um, you know we we're, we're in an environment these days with powerhouses with combined authorities. And Hampshire needs to ensure that it isn't complacent in relation to that, but but manages to secure its fair share um, of, of, of the action moving forwards. And then levelling up, another big issue that's come out from this government that, that, that means we are pushing uphill, but the, increasingly the government is looking to Hampshire as, as a county council to lead future funding programmes for government, the most recent one being the Community Renewal Fund, which is the precursor to the Shared Prosperity Fund, which we will be the lead authority for moving forwards, which provides us with with an enormous opportunity. And also we've been working you know, at a Pan Hampshire level on all the levelling up fund bids to make sure that we we try to work collaboratively as we can in developing those bids, um, both in terms of the transport bids that we, you know, we can put in ourselves, but also with the other bids being um, put forward by the districts and by the unitary authorities as well. Um, the Freeport, um, big government flagship program. It was good news that we were announced as one of the eight English uh, Freeports um, moving forwards. A massive opportunity as part of Global Britain and, and that brand. Uh, and, and, and our, our competitiveness moving forward. So we're now uh, into the delivery stages, working in collaboration with, with other partners uh, in terms of making the Freeport a, a reality for, for Hampshire. Um, and then the economic development support services, which, which, which I've already sort of run through. And finally, just to say, you know, strategic collaboration and partnerships is what we're all about um, and, and benefiting as much as we can 
to grow uh, that strong economy, make it inclusive and enable uh, Hampshire to be uh, a sustainable, prosperous, um, green environment uh, moving forwards. Thank you very much. Uh, do I need to pass on to Keith? Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself there. Uh, Keith, um, uh, Keith uh, well, I, I'm going to say, uh, uh, Keith, I think the, probably the best thing to do is probably if you go next and then we'll save all the questions till the end, I think, because as Stuart mentioned, I think quite rightly, there may be some overlap. <clears throat> so, Keith, if you're next. Yeah, OK. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, just while the slides are coming up, OK, good morning, members. Uh, my name is Keith Wilcox. I'm the Assistant Director for Transport. Uh, I've worked for Hampshire County Council for a long time. It's been over two spells, uh, but I've also worked for transport consultancies and I've been a bid director for a major transport operator, spending a lot of time working on Manchester Metrolink and some heavy rail franchises. So that's my background, but I mean, in total, I've probably been at Hampshire over 25 years. So uh, I know the layout, should we say, and the geography. OK. Um, 10 minutes from me in terms of what is in the transport, what we cover, senior management structure and the resources and the, and the current workload. I'm just going to start with the objective there. The highways network and transport systems support the economy. Absolutely critical. It's about providing that connectivity. It's all about that movement of people and goods. The services to in my group is really two parts. There's firstly the integrated transport and then there is the implementation. On the integrated transport side, that's about the transport planning, the policy, it's the development of transport schemes from concept, doing the business case, working out the evidence base and looking at that sort of early design. Also covers passenger transport and that's all modes. We look at bus, rail, ferry and air. There's also the community transport in the rural areas. We look after the concessionary fares as supported bus services. And we have a small traded services unit where we undertake sort of paid work for external organisations such as the South Downs and town and parish councils. The implementation side really is about the delivery of what is coming out of that front part, the delivery of the huge capital programme, small schemes, large schemes. There's also travel planning work and working with developers and our highways development planning function. Some statistics at the bottom of that slide. I'm just going to pick out the first two, if I may. Um, 170 million has been secured through bidding to our capital programme since 2018 and 19. So a lot of activity is looking at where the money is coming from. Is it LEPs? Is it central government departments? And trying to put good, coherent bids in. 96%, the next one, 96% of Hampshire's journeys are on roads. This is a significant number. That's sort of almost cars, light goods, vehicles, heavy goods, walking and cycling. It's only really rail that isn't included in that figure. But it shows, that figure just shows the importance of the highway asset to the county council. It's so integral to the movement of people and goods and for the economy to function. I go to the next slide, please, Katie. Well, oh, something's gone wrong. Can't see it. OK, OK. The structure in transport is that I have two reports. I have Frank Baxter, who is integrated transport. He looks after the passenger transport and that's the operational side and the strategy infrastructure side. He looks after transport planning and policy, the scheme development. So Frank and his team is the ideas, the policy, the generation of schemes. Under Frank, we've got public transport, which is Andrew Wilson, public bus, the PT strategy, concessionary fares. We've got Dominic McGrath, who looks after feasibility, the initial start of projects and the traded services unit. The next one, you may see a very small asterisk after the 10. That asterisk is it's a very recent change. Heather Wormsley's moved out of her post of major scheme development and bidding into a effectively a dedicated project post. She will be focusing full time on M27 Junction 10 at Wellbourne, which I'll come and talk about later. But that is a between a 70 to 100 million pound quite special project. 
The last box there is the vacancy left by Heather. That's important that we fill that. It's a key position to make sure that the development of the pipeline of schemes continues. On the right hand side, David Wilson is my other report. Uh, David looks after the entire sort of capital programme, the highway development planning function and traffic surveys. I look at it that sort of Frank thinks of the ideas and David makes it happen. That's a little bit sort of in a summary, but I think members would understand those that know the people and the way the group works. David has Ben Clifton, who is highways development planning. This is where we ensure the impact of, of all new development is suitably mitigated on the highway network. And we have Ben Smith, who is looks after the capital program delivery, all schemes, minor and major. Thank you. Next slide, please. OK, the resources uh, is just under 200 people. Um, it's really about 115 of what I would call core staff and the rest, the 70 are really external with a large number of casual, which is sort of traffic enumerators. It's a large, it's a well qualified group. We comprise sort of chartered engineers, chartered planners, economists, and transport specialists who sort of look after both the operational side and the infrastructure. The budget is 20 million, that's revenue budget. The large proportion is on the integrated transport side at just about 19 million. And that sort of looks at the, the local bus subsidy, that's for the services that are not commercial, but includes a large figure on community transport and concessionary fares. Concessionary fares is about 13 million out of that 14 and a half. Then we've got on the implementation side on David's. It's a much smaller budget because fundamentally the majority is recharged to the capital projects. Just got this little table on the right hand side showing the capital programme just to give members an idea of how times have changed after the last sort of over the last well, nine, ten years. You can see bottom left box total value 58. It was 58 million was the total starts value of the capital program back in about 12, 13. That has now risen if we include junction 10 to 164 to 194 million is a significant increase of, of scale and complexity of some of the projects that we are now dealing with. I think the other point just to highlight there is that there's many more High value majors is about 11 now compared to the four or five back in 2012. And less schemes, perhaps of the smaller, less, less schemes on the less than two million mark. So the, the situation is sort of changing. And I just thought it was worth just putting that slide up. OK, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there's a lot on this slide in terms of current workload opportunities. I'll just go through and, and pick some of these things out to give you a flavour as to as to where we are at present. Local Transport Plan 4, this is a, a major transformational new local transport plan. Uh, we've undertaken the initial uh, engagement. We have consultation um, perhaps later this year, early next year, with a view of trying to have it adopted around the summer of 22. Bus back better strategy is a really difficult one to, to say that, but the new government bus strategy came out in February. It's quite prescriptive. Uh, we've got to respond in June and we've got to produce a, a bus improvement plan uh, by October. But whilst it's called bus, it's really very consistent with government policy in terms of about the decarbonisation of transport and the levelling up of the economy. Active travel, walk, cycling. We were doing this before COVID. It was on the to-do list. It was becoming more and more important. COVID has accelerated that process. Um, we've had emergency active travel funding, uh, about 860,000 last summer. We then had and bid three and a half million, just under three and a half million for a tranche two. And those schemes are, are progressing and going through the current uh, committee process. Um, very much walk and cycling. That's the focus of them. Next one, Transport for the South East is a, is a national, subnational transport body, uh, a major a group looking across from Kent to Hampshire, including unitaries, counties and LEPs. Uh, Councillor Humvee sits on that shadow board of that organisation. Quite important going forward because the studies right the way through the South East will be culminated into an implementation plan and therefore it's important that we have a seat at that top table. 
Basingstoke, a massive area of work for us, uh, a new hospital um, proposed just near Junction 7 off of the M3, one of 40 national new major hospitals, and then the vast amount of development to the west of the town centre. Another significant area of activity is the water side. Richard has, has mentioned the Freeport. Uh, in terms of that, some of the big schemes, the 326, uh, circa 100 million pound improvement highway, water side rail, circa 60, 80 million in terms of reopening that line to passenger, which is um, submitted a business case to the government. I think it's being received very well and it looks as if Network Rail will be taking that project forward. Um, the key one there is it will be a major consultation just about to start on the water side, hopefully at the end of this month. M27 Junction 10, um, a significant project. You need to, the motorway junction needs to happen to unlock 6,000 houses, 6,000 jobs, and a possible inward investment opportunity of 500 million pounds. It is a massive scale development, and we have decided to put a dedicated project team onto it. Delivery of the capital programme, um, as you saw from the previous slide, huge scale. Uh, this year it will be over 100 million in terms of schemes in that development. The Eclipse Busway Extension in Gosport, the Brighton Hill Roundabout in Basingstoke, Stubbington Bypass and the 326 Southern Section. Last one, delivery of the Transforming City Funds. This was bidded, it's Southampton, it's the regions of Southampton and Portsmouth, 100 million in total. The County Council will have about 40 million of that 100. So a lot going on there. Opportunities, always look for bidding opportunities and trading opportunities and challenges. Richard's mentioned it, the economic recovery is a critical challenge and transport is one of the key enablers to uh, address that. Just this week, just a quick update on figures, the cars are back to about 95% of pre-COVID levels, bus patronage is about 60 to 70% of pre-COVID and rail lagging behind at about the 40% mark. But perhaps a quicker return than perhaps we expected. My last column there is stakeholders and partners, very, very significant uh, names for the transport group. We work with them very closely. Um, it's very important to us to understand what their respective objectives are, both public sector and private sector. And we have regular dialogue with really all of those stakeholders and partners. And I think that I believe that that has, has really been of great value over recent years. And we do have some fairly good inside tracks as to perhaps what may be going on in the world of transport. I'll leave it there if I may, Chairman. Keith, thank so, you very much indeed. Um, who, who's next on my list? I think it's I think it's James, Chairman. James, yes, it is. James, James, thank you very much, Keith. James, would you like to go next? Thank you very much, Chairman. I've just managed to uh, get my mouse to work and unmute myself. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm James Potter. Uh, a little bit of background to myself, I joined the County Council initially in uh, 1997 uh, at the start of the uh, sort of project integra, the waste um, program, uh, after a period of working uh, on environmental projects in uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, in 2000, I left to get some commercial experience and ended up as the general manager for materials recovery and recycling uh, for Veolia for a period of time and then returned to the County Council in, I think, the summer of 2007, after a period of travelling with my family. Um, I'm sort of here representing the Waste Planning and Environment uh, service stream. Uh, it's a fairly broad spectrum service stream, but uh, dominated to a degree by uh, waste, which is the sort of the bulk of the, the value to the service stream anyhow. Uh, Hampshire is a waste disposal authority and as, uh, as such has statutory responsibilities to arrange the disposal of residual waste and to provide facilities, at least one, where residents can dispose of their bulky waste, uh, i.e. household waste recycling centres. The council has gone beyond these responsibilities by entering into the project integral partnership and providing um, facilities for our district partners 
uh, materials recycling facilities so that we can separate their curbside and banked uh, collected recyclables. We are currently engaged in responding to three major consultations from DEFRA, which is going to significantly change the way local authority waste services are delivered in the future. Um, these include uh, extended producer responsibility, uh, which will require the producers to pay, apologies for that, uh, a pay for um, the full net cost recovery um, associated to the packaging they place onto the market, i.e pay local authorities the collection and any processing costs. There's also a proposal for a deposit return scheme, which would, is proposed to uh, capture glass, metal and drinks containers, um, but potentially will remove a large chunk of the material that we currently already handle and uh, collect and uh, recycle. And the third one of these, uh, aimed sort of solely at local authorities, is the consistency and recycling proposals, which will require all local authorities to collect the same range of materials and will also include requirements for us to collect food waste on a weekly basis. These implementation, these are due to be implemented in about 2023, um, will require both changes in collection and processing infrastructure that we already have. So we're working uh, with our partners on that and I will be presenting an update to the HIOLA leaders tomorrow to, uh, to keep them informed. I have unfortunately heard um, yesterday that the government aren't intending to respond uh, to the responses to their consultation until the sort of late to the back end of this year, which is uh, unfortunate because it just might puts time pressure on everyone trying to make decisions. From a planning point of view, we are a minerals and waste planning authority. Um, and therefore, we sort of seek to ensure appropriate development and uh, infrastructure in line with our minerals and waste plan, which we are currently uh, in the process of reviewing and updating, and the policy team are doing that. And then we run the plan, we sort of have managed planning applications, particularly in response to the minerals and waste side of things, but also uh, some Reg 3 ones. Um, and that's delivered through our development management team. And I believe there the, was the first of the Reg committees. Uh, of the administration yesterday, which I understand worked very well. We also have a uh, sort of strategic spatial planning team um, and uh, operate a, a land supply team that sort of keeps provides information to all of our district partners. Um, and we're also increasingly trading our expertise to other local authorities, including undertaking the minerals waste plan for a consortium of Berkshire authorities. Uh, that is now uh, with the inspectorate and waiting uh, that to open, I think, probably later in the summer, um, and also doing some development management work on behalf of Somerset County Council. From an environment point of view, uh, we have sort of several uh, remits to sort of protect and enhance Hampshire's natural built environment. Um, and we do this through our role as a statutory consultee. Um, but we also supply and have increasingly supplied through the sort of transformation period of the last 10 years, uh, consultancy services, both internally and externally, um, in areas such as ecology, environmental impacts, archeology, span landscaping. We also host the Hampshire Biodiversity Information Center as well as the Solent Forum. Um, we're also, from a flood and water management point of view, the lead local flood authority, uh, and last year published the revised flood and water management strategy. Um, we have ongoing work on flood alleviation projects, such as Buckskin uh, and Rumsey and various others, and engaging with local flood groups uh, to try and with the aim of improving self-reliance. Going forward, we are aware of a sort of raft of new responsibilities that are going to come out of the Environment Bill, which is currently travelling through Parliament. Things such as local nature recovery strategies, a law of biodiversity, net gain, natural capital, all of those are coming down the track and we are looking at how to adapt our resources to be able to accommodate these and uh, looking towards uh, a, a sort of an environment strategy for Hampshire to try and help us uh, do that. Uh, we're also, I also host uh, the climate change team. Now this is a, should we say, a embedded team, but a corporate team. We've declared a climate emergency and set targets that align with national policy to be carbon neutral by 2050. But in addition, and 
almost uniquely for a local authority, we've set a target to be resilient to the impacts of a two degree temperature rise. So whilst trying to, um, shall we say, avoid any rises, we're also make, trying to make sure that we're resilient to that imp impact if it happens. Uh, these targets are for both the council as an organization and also the county as a geographic area. And the team's role is we've sort of published strategy and there's a whole host of information on the, on the website, publish the strategy, publish the action plan and those things. And then the team's role is to, shall we say, support and monitor the actions internally uh, rather than actually delivering it because it's a team of uh, sort of only a team of four people. But the main focus uh, is then on working and engaging with community stakeholders to enable them to implement the necessary changes that will be required. And we do this through um, an expert forum, which uh, Councillor Warwick chairs, um, and also funding pilots and other grassroots campaigns, such as the Greening Campaign, community energy projects, and uh, subsidising residential solar, solar and that sort of thing. The team also managed the ongoing uh, Hampshire 2050 programme. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, the structure uh, from the waste side of things, uh, Sam Horn is my deputy and ably supported by Paul Laughlin. In the environment, uh, there's Simon Cramp and uh, he sort of focuses on the flood and water management side and the landscapes side with Nikki Court uh, taking on the specialist environmental services. So ecology, archeology, span um, HPIC, the Hampshire Biodiversity Information Centre, and also the EIA team. From a planning point of view, uh, Laura McCulloch is the sort of strategic planner, um, ably again supported by Melissa Spriggs, who's uh, running the review of the Minor Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan, and uh, Lisa Kirby Hawks, who uh, is uh, running the sort of the development side and the, and the Red Committee element. And then Chicha Nadaraja is leading on the climate change. and. Uh, some of you may know them already. Hopefully, those that you don't, you will meet in uh, later sessions of the Select Committee and uh, throughout the course of the administration. Next slide, please. Um, so, from a resources point of view, uh, sort of just under 100 people, FTEs. Um, and uh, from a budget point of view, the uh, waste disposal uh, budget or the contracts are by and far the sort of the biggest expense at about sort of 42.5 million. A number of, as I've said, a number of the uh, staff are, should we say, income generating and therefore they're sort of cost neutral in that respect. Uh, that's something we are, we are looking to extend, but also recognising that the landscape is changing and that we need to adjust in order to be able or to have that strategic direction as well as doing the traded and the consultancy work. From a capital program point of view, this is probably a um, sort of slightly smaller number than it will to end up being, um, as these are sort of committed spends at this point of view, point of time. Um, from a waste point of view, this sort of covers um, a bit of a sort of HWRC maintenance and some work proposed work on the sort of closed landfill sites. Uh, what it doesn't include is any investment in new infrastructure to meet the new government requirements. Um, and those are likely to be uh, multiple tens of millions in order to be able to do that, both in terms of uh, building new infrastructure and also adapting existing infrastructure like the transfer stations to accommodate any new collection practices. Uh, flood and water, uh, flood risk and coastal defence. Um, yes, that's sort of a committed spend at the moment, but it doesn't necessarily include, should we say, the polishing off of some of the projects like Buckskin, which is sort of, we've already got the grant and aid and et cetera, um, nor does it uh, account for any external funding sources that we might be able to leverage uh, over the course of the uh, capital program period from local levy or grant and aid and those sorts of things. So next slide, please. I've covered most of the sort of current outlook uh, earlier in the conversation, so I sort of focus on the uh, this point and the stakeholders and partners and the sort of the wide range and uh, many different guises that they they come in as i've mentioned we're partners in project integra with all of the district boroughs and unitaries in hampshire and all the two cities um, and we also host the uh, project integra administration function 
We're the lead partner at Coast Signatories with the two cities and both national parks on the Hampshire and Minerals and Waste Plan. Um, we also have service level agreements with most districts and boroughs uh, for environmental services, so the ecology, landscape, uh, archaeology and biodiversity data, as well as supporting our own capital program. Uh, we work uh, with the Environment Agency, both as a regulator on the waste side, but also as a partner on the sort of flood and water management schemes. Uh, and we have a wide range of relationships with other stakeholders through uh, uh, hosting the HBIC partnership. Uh, and also a number of coastal stakeholders as well. So it is a, a varied and uh, broad pattern. The one thing we do need to be careful of is that because we have, should we say, so many points of contact with so many different stakeholders, we need to be careful about managing these relationships and the expectations that people have of us and the demands on our time because these invariably outstrip our available resources. So we just need to, uh, should we say, set the levels of expectations early but thank you very much thank you thank you very much indeed james that was another excellent presentation uh, right we would have tim i think next but he's not with us is he so who, who's who's doing the next presentation on uh, highways traffic and engineering chairman it's my good self stuart giddings stuart welcome uh, all yours thank you um uh, yeah apologies tim couldn't be here today so um he asked me kindly to step in um I can't say much about Tim. I know he's been around a long time, probably as long as me, but just a little bit about myself. Uh, started back in 88, so I have been here um, a long time. Um, but I did take five years out uh, between 2002 and 2007 and went to the dark side and went to work for a contractor. It was Rainsbury at the time and then Balfour BT. Um, but I found uh, working for a contractor was far too difficult and I came back to work for, uh, for Hampshire and work as a client. So uh, that's where I've come from. And to be honest, I've been on Tim's coattails uh, ever since. Uh, he started perhaps a year or two uh, before me and we sort of worked our way through uh, the business together. Um, so he covers, um, so taking on Tim's role, <clears throat> he covers highways, traffic and engineering um, and in essence uh, we have uh, the responsibility to maintain uh, uh, the highway network. Uh, it's a large, very large network, a very large Shire County, one of the largest counties in the country. Um, we, if we don't um, look after, maintain the network and everything on it, in it, under it, over it, through it, um, then obviously all the opportunities for economic development can't happen. People can't get to their hospitals. Um, we can't do all the improvements that we want to do um, without the network. Um, and it's so important to all of us. Uh, many of you have heard this before. It's a universal um, network uh, and it's universally used um, and it's really important um, and to take an aside from others uh, there is as we saw earlier 1.4 million people in Hampshire there are many many of them that think they're highway engineers and know better than us uh, but I've taken a note today that with a chartered highway engineer uh, in the midst of us uh, we will need to be careful not that we ever try to pull, it, uh, pull the wool over anybody's eyes um, but it'd be always interesting to have a challenge from a, from a professional colleague. Um, a huge area of interest, um, if I just take a few of them, uh, highways delivery, um, frontline services were responsible for the maintenance uh, and that can cover everything from uh, potholes, grass cutting, weed killing uh, and dealing with all the inquiries that come in throughout the year. Uh, we have a highways operations centre where uh, predominantly all the highway inquiries come in. They manage those inquiries, divvy them up to either teams within the department uh, or out to the front line where our highway engineers will go out and undertake uh, checks and balances, uh, speak to the parishes, your good selves, uh, and then try and do a response accordingly. Uh, responsible for the statutory requirement to undertake highway inspections on the network, uh, as well as tree inspections. Uh, we have a duty to, to undertake those to keep the network safe. Um, we have a statutory responsibility to maintain the highway, but only a duty to keep it safe. Uh, and it is a very difficult uh, and challenging um, objective. Uh, we're also within delivery, we have the arboriculture, so we look after uh, many, many trees. Uh, it's in excess of, oh, I can't remember the number now, apologies, uh, many hundreds of thousands, uh, and it grows, as you can imagine. Uh, and on the delivery front, we're also responsible for, for weather emergency response. So whether that's uh, currently with the uh, th thunderstorms and the, and the heavy rain that can come down, right the way through to the previous flooding that we've had over the many years, and also in a, a cold and, and, and snow event. Um, the other side of it is highways commissioning. Um, that's where I head up, the highways commissioning. Um, 
more from a, um, a client perspective because obviously um, under Keith's role that we've heard, he'll deliver, Frank will come up with clever ideas and um, David Wilson then delivers uh, lots of good uh, schemes on the network, but they then hand it over to me to maintain. So in essence, I'm responsible from an asset management perspective and budget management perspective to ensure that we then maintain all the uh, items that we build onto the network, including the existing network and maintain it. Uh, we have a planned maintenance team who look after the larger schemes, whether it's carriage or resurfacing, uh, foot resurfacing, um, including drainage improvements. Uh, but we also do our surface treatments. So for many people, uh, I'll use the, the old terminology, the tar and chippings that you see that go down the network. Uh, but we also do some thin um, veneers called micro ash routes as well. And that's that's within the planned maintenance team. Um, and I'm, we're also within the Highways Commission responsible for the roadworks coordination. Now, this is a very, very tricky role. Um, certainly in the Basingstoke area, people have mentioned it before today. Um, uh, they're responsible for managing our own works on the network and all the utilities that work on the network. Uh, and we need to coordinate that to try and keep people moving, uh, customers happy, um, uh, as well as residents that find you know, it's difficult to get to and from home or to and from work and all those other issues. So it's a very tricky role, uh, but highways coordination has become uh, a real forefront with the DFT. And it's something we're trying to improve to make sure that you know, we keep the economic development people moving around the network as best possible. Taking the highways traffic, uh, responsible for road safety, um, traffic signals and street lighting. Um, without these items, then a lot of the traffic can't get round and street lighting is so important for a number of many number of reasons. Uh, another key area, this ties in with all the, all the elements that we, we've talked about. Um, they are responsible for keeping sure pe uh, Pelican crossings, pedestrian crossings are, are installed uh, and maintained. Um, and linking with all the work that we do on a frontline highways delivery perspective. Then the other key area that Tim has is our engineering consultancy. Um, they are responsible in essence for all our highways and structures design work. They are a design team. Uh, they cover, started to cover many other areas, both internally and externally. Um, they have uh, the road agreements uh, or part of the road agreements team that work closely with uh, colleagues in Keith's team, where we put, we'll work with developers, uh, understanding what they want to do on our highway network to make improvements or changes when a new development's installed. Um, and they also have the road safety, uh, sorry, the safety audit team who will check uh, that everything we do is as safe as possible and safe for the network. There's a number of key facts along the bottom. I, we could have put many, many facts in there. And one other, just for everyone's information, uh, we have some uh, 220,000 gullies that we have to clean on a regular basis. And if you add the other, all the other drainage assets on there, it's in excess of 250,000 units in or under our network that we have to look after. Uh, we have a huge network, as you can see, um, and it's uh, rather complex. Can I have my next slide, please? Um, there you can see Tim would, would be here today and it would be at the top. Then there's my good self under highways commissioning. Uh, I'm splitting to, th I have three, three chaps working for me. Uh, Peter Rooney, who's technical support, he looks after our um, Hampshire Highway Services contract, which is in essence our milestone contract. We have a good working relationship with Milestone and they are currently delivering the majority of our highway maintenance work on our network. Um, I then have uh, Richard Basto and Leon Churchill who split between the two roles between them. Uh, and Richard uh, is looking after our asset management team, making sure we look at the condition of the network and, and what we're doing to keep it in a safe and reasonable condition. And then Highways Operation, Leon is responsible for the major works and he, it's him and his team that will be writing to you on various occasions warning you that we're going to close a road for a number of days or weeks while we do undertake major, improve, oh, major maintenance works. He, the second team he's got is Highways Delivery, and that's Peter Barty. In essence, Peter is predominantly responsible for the day-to-day -day activities of all the highway engineers and the depots and all the local work that happens on the ground, which is, in essence, uh, dealing with the 70 to 100,000 inquiries that we get, dealing with all the potholes and all the issues there. He's got three people that work with him, Margaret Myers, who is responsible for our Highways Operations Centre. Um, so that's our back office team that deal with all the inquiries, validate and issue them out to the right teams. And then uh, two colleagues that many of you will probably be aware of, uh, Paula Edwards and Steve Pellet. We split the county into the north and south. Paula is responsible for the southern part of the county uh, with a number of depots. And Steve Pellet is responsible for the north of the county um, with a number of depots in the north. Third section is, is highways um, traffic, which is Adrian Gray. He's highways traffic and safety with Mark Samways. Uh, and big area um, would be uh, the parking, 
uh, and all the work we're doing around parking, uh, road, uh, some road safety elements uh, and traffic uh, works. And then uh, also under <coughs> Adrian is Andy Wren, who's responsible for all our highway traffic systems. So that could be our, our um, traffic signals, uh, pedestrian and pelican crossings, toucans and the like. And he's also responsible for our street lighting and our current street lighting uh, is through a PFI. Uh, and then the fourth arm is, uh, as we said earlier, engineering consultancy uh, managed by Chris Peake. Uh, and he has a deputy, Matt Chill. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? Uh, resources. Um, Tim seems to be waving the flag for the number of resources he's got. He's got 564.15. Yeah, so he's got uh, in excess of just shy of uh, just over 550 plus staff. There is 170 plus um, school crossing patrol people included in that number. So that does look why it's, it's significantly high. Uh, but he has a, has a, a big number of staff. Um, the revenue budget we have for this year is just shy of uh, 39 million. Uh, as you can see, highways, uh, engineering consultancy have a, a very small amount of that because they are a um, engineering consultancy in their own right. We treat them as a business unit and they, in essence, wash their face accordingly. They're cost neutral predominantly, but there is still some costs uh, in there. Uh, highways HQ, um, the 10.6 million um, is uh, a lot of things like our grass cutting, weed killing um, and major maintenance works or some of our major maintenance works. Uh, highways operation, the 13.9 million, that would be all the works done by the depots and the local LHEs in the area. And highways traffic is the PFI, street lighting and um, ITS signals works. Just on a capital side, now that's where we do include a lot of our highway operations consideration, our upwards work, sorry, and our major maintenance. Uh, it's managed by me as the commissioner, but it also includes work on structures and traffic signals. And for this year, we have 48.3 million, but that does fluctuate because we will, for instance, bid to the DFT and get uh, challenge fund money. So, for instance, we've been successful uh, recently in the last couple of years in getting some money to put towards the works that we're doing at Redbridge Viaducts and Redbridge Bridges to um, bring them back up to a, a life uh, condition that we would uh, find uh, suitable for the next 60 years. Last slide, please. Current outlook and some of the pressures we've got. Highways, um, an increasing demand. I mean, many people have heard it and, and you'll probably continue to hear it and you'll probably possibly hear it throughout the administration. Uh, in highways, we have an increasing demand in inquiries. Um, that's predominantly in the last three to six months with more people out walking and cycling, which is brilliant. Uh, but they're finding more and more issues, perhaps on footways and cycleways that we were not necessarily uh, receiving quite so much. Um, and that is partly also with the long-standing shortfall in investment, uh, which is a national issue from the DFT, uh, predominantly on the capital side. Um, we are, in essence, managing a network that um, could be argued is in decline. Certain elements are definitely struggling to ma ma maintain themselves at uh, a ready state. Uh, we're also having to manage uh, the climate change impact. James mentioned it earlier. We work closely with James's team um, to consider uh, carbon, but more importantly, also when we do any improvement works or when we do any um, plan maintenance works, uh, can we make sure that the uh, surface and the materials and the and the road or carriage or footwear, whatever we're working on, can we leave it uh, resilient for a two degree impact uh, in the future? Um, and on highways, we're working closely with Milestone. We have a good working relationship with Milestone. Milestone have got good contract, a good contract of performing well with us, uh, but there's always room for improvement and we're working hard with Milestone to maximise every opportunity in that contract. On the traffic front, um, this is part of our problem. We have an ageing uh, signals infrastructure and we're starting to have to put more and more capital maintenance money into that to, to maintain it to a safe and, and uh, level state. Um, that we're looking uh, to undertake an LED switchover uh, which is a T21 project uh, on 11,000 street lighting units uh, to offer um, a payback over a number of years to bring in some savings. We have a contract with Siemens uh, and, and Scottish and Southern Electricity who look after the streetlights and Siemens are our traffic signals contractor. Uh, their performance has been good and we're working closely with those to maximise any opportunity in those contracts. And the new element that's coming in the last year or so, uh, or within the last year I should say, apologies, is parking. A new service in 2000, um, we've taken on some of the district's parking and we're looking at to further abroad across the county um, and that's being delivered by a contractor, NSL. And the last point is our engineering consultancy team. 
Um, they're extremely busy. Um, Keith has mentioned that he's, he's, he's doubled uh, or trebled the uh, capital program in years and uh, the subsequent pushback is then into our engineering consultancy teams. They have to build, expand uh, and cope with the delivery and design of the capital schemes and help with the delivery, certainly on our contract uh, tendering contract management front um, and, and make sure that's delivered as well. Uh, we're trying to make them a knowledge centre of excellence. Um, they, they are, it's nice to have a, be in a county where we have our own engineering consultancy team. It's, it's an excellent opportunity for us to utilise. It's a great point of excellence and knowledge uh, and we, I wouldn't like to, to lose it. Um, and then, but more importantly, we're embedding a more commercial approach all the time to see where opportunities are to further afield into third parties, working with colleagues and, and see where we go. Uh, with time in mind, I'll leave it there. Chairman, thank you. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Colleen, can I just say, I'm sure I'm speaking on your behalf, those were four absolutely outstanding presentations and, uh, and extremely useful, extremely informative. And, and I'd, like to, uh, to, I'd like to thank Richard, Keith, James and, and Stuart for stepping in for Tim. Thank you very much for those presentations. I thought they were excellent. Stuart, so Stuart Jarvis, do you, do you want to just tidy up a couple of things at the end before I open this up to any questions from uh, from from members? Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, um, and thank you for your kind um, comments to my colleagues. And um, we we certainly aim to try to give members a kind of flavour of of the main service areas and some of the issues which are coming up. I, I'm, I was conscious, Chairman, as I listened to the presentations, that the one thing we probably didn't do was give you an overall sort of set of numbers of key overall budgets. You've sort of had the different chunks of it. Um, if it would be helpful, I'd be very happy to try and put something out um, to circulate to members on that. But the, the budget, I, I mean, I apologise for bringing it down to a discussion about money, Chairman, but so often these days that, that is what it's about. And the, the reality for ETE is that we've had 10 years of austerity that have had a significant impact on our ability to maintain the highway network. So, um, you know, I agree with what Stuart Gidding says. We we have been in a state of managing the decline of the highway network for the last decade. Um, that decline is accelerating now because after 10 years of not doing enough maintenance, the, the network is starting to get worn. Um, and, it, you know, we desperately need to see more funds going into maintenance. And, that, and as Stuart Gidding said, that's not a Hampshire problem, that's a national problem. Um, it's a national problem that central government haven't really tackled. And despite some of the, the, the rhetoric um, that's come out of Parliament, we've actually seen a very significant cut in our highway maintenance budget from the government in the current financial year, um, which, which will undoubtedly now mean that some of the things that we hope to do in Hampshire this year won't go ahead despite the fact that the county council has tried to put extra money in locally. Um, the, the ETE budget, the cash limit for ETE in 2021-22 is just over 103 million, Chairman. Um, and that is 12 million pounds less than it was 10 years ago. And, and that's a stark statistic, members, because both the social care services have 50 million pounds more than they did 10 years ago. And that just reflects the pressure on local government, the, the, the demand pressures in social care and the hard choices that the county councils had to make um, over that period. And I only mention these numbers, Chairman, because I think often members feel that, you know, particularly in the highway service, which as Stuart said is a universal one, there's a feeling that we're not able to meet the residents' expectations. We don't do all the things that we used to do. And, and the answer to those questions is that, that that is unfortunately correct. We're not able to do everything that we'd like to do, and we're not able to meet the expectations that I think you know members of the public have. And it's very often very difficult for members in those circumstances because the, the demands on social care are compelling and they are exponentially growing. Um, you know, and as we kind of get the, the results of lockdown being eased, again, the, the pressure on children's social care is intense, not just in Hampshire, but across the whole country. So some tough decisions have been made over the years, Chairman, and I just wanted really to put the financial context. I think the other thing to say, and again, it's an interesting one, 
Um, typically, my department spends about a million pounds a week on highways and, and highways traffic and transport and about a million pounds a week on waste. And um, adult social care typically spends just under a million pounds a day on social care. And um, to give you some idea of the kind of scale of, of, of the difference. Um, so the, a very significant part of the county council's revenue budget is spent on our social care services simply because looking after the most vulnerable you know, is, is the highest priority that the council's had. But there is a knock on effect that that has on universal services like HWRCs and highways. Um, and that, that is undoubtedly reflected in the levels of service and some of the frustrations. Uh, Chairman, if I may just conclude my remarks with being perhaps a little bit more positive, it, it's also really, really heartening for someone like me as a, a kind of lifetime professional in environment services that the environment has suddenly gone up the agenda um, nationally, up the national political agenda. And whether that's around responding to the climate change challenge that we face, um, whether it's about sort of you know improving the quality of the environment, protecting the environment, um, and tackling issues like poor air quality, it's really important, really helpful to have that at the, the kind of forefront of the national agenda alongside economic recovery. And I'm firmly of the view that we can have a, a greener and um, a more equitable economic recovery that is also good for the environment and will help to generate the resources that we need to kind of reinvest in improving um, environmental quality. Hampshire has an excellent natural and built environment. We've got a strong economy and I think the challenge is how one kind of preserves those things looking ahead. So my final um, plea or pitch to members would be have, do have a look at the Hampshire 2050 stuff, the work that the County Council did over the last few years looking at a vision for Hampshire in 2050 and what would be the main things that might get in the way of Hampshire continuing to be an economically prosperous um, and environmentally excellent place and there's some really interesting material in that and the County Council collectively I know is sort of redoubling its efforts to try to ensure that we deliver against some of those very challenging ambitions for Hampshire 2050, Chairman, and I'm sure the Select Committee will be at the heart um, of some of those considerations as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart, to you and your staff, and I think those uh, were some, some very important points made there and puts the, uh, the whole of the uh, presentations into context. I'm going to open it up to members, but before I do, I think the appropriately the next word goes to uh, to Councillor Rob Humby, uh, who uh, is the our principal chief executive member. Can I call you that, Rob? I, I'm not sure really I, whether that, that that's that's fair to Russell and uh, and Jan, but uh, so probably the, the the senior the senior executive member, Rob. Well um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure about that. Um, um, as I'm sure the other two would agree. I, th I think officially it's the lead member, Mr. Chairman, I think I would say. So thank you for this opportunity and uh, well done to you for chairing so far. So I just wanted to say a couple of things, if I may. First of all, um, excellent presentations for, from all the uh, officers. Um, I know you've said that. Um, it's not easy doing this sometimes and it's also quite difficult to cover the broad range of things that we do in a short presentation like that. But I think it does give you um, some idea of the sort of the scale of the work that um, ETE does. Um, I can tell you, I meet a lot of my uh, relevant colleagues across the country sometimes, and all I can say is um, yeah, we are absolutely sure have some of the best officers there are dealing with these sort of issues across the country. I'm very proud that we're in Hampshire and the work that we do. And as I say, Mr. Chairman, that you, you, it's given you a bit of a snapshot, snapshot of the um, the scale uh, that, that we do and, and the issues that we have to deal with on a daily basis that is continuing and then being able to react to things, certainly with weather events and that. But you can also see, Mr. Chairman, why I'm very grateful that I now have two colleagues helping me to deliver some of that work across the ETE. So thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman. But I just want to say the officers are there to help. We do do a brilliant job, talk to the officers where we can. There is a process of that in place, but it's always really good to have a chat with them first, certainly um, with Stuart, where we can or where you can as well, just to get a bit of a heads up. So there is that bigger picture.
before we sort of take different approaches and things snowball out before we get to the actual facts and details. I know the existing members know that, but for new members, it's really good to sort of try and have those conversations in the first place. Thank you, Mr Chairman. No, thank you very much, Rob, uh, and thank you for the uh, for the work that you've been doing. I've been on the ETE Select Committee as a backbencher, if you like, for the last four years, and uh, and I can testify the workload that you have uh, and you have had over the last four years. And I can very well understand that you'd need to, uh, if you like, uh, to share some of that workload because the, you, one only has to look at the remit of this committee and it is absolutely vast. Uh, and the presentations, I think, have probably put that, uh, that, that well and truly into context. So thank you, Rob. Do I have any, uh, any questions for any of the officers from members? I'm looking at my screen and, uh, and whether people have got difficulty with their electronic hands or, or anything like that, whether they just simply want to just uh, shout out or wave at me or whatever. I can't see anyone at the moment, which I'm amazed at, to be perfectly honest, who, who has, hasn't got a question at this stage. But does anyone have any questions? Can anyone spot anyone? Got Councillor Hughes, Chairman. Councillor Hughes, thank you, because I can only see very few people. So I do apologise, Gary. Councillor Hughes. Uh, Chairman, um, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed all the uh, presentations. It's nice to uh, hear them again and be refreshed on the, the uh, expanded roles that uh, everybody performs. The one question I do have is around the highways. And there was mention about the fact that um, uh, highways operations undertake such things such as um, uh, weed spraying, etc. Well, I understand that a lot of local authorities also do that, and I was always always under the impression that local authorities did that under contract from Hampshire. Can, can I have some clarification on that, please? S certainly, Councillor, um, you are absolutely right. Um, that, well, there is a hybrid within um, the county. Uh, some of the weed spraying treatments are undertaken by Milestone through our Hampshire Highways contract, uh, but we have always offered the various district councils, if they so wish, to undertake it through an agency agreement, and a number of districts have taken that on board. Uh, we offer it out every few years, um, and so, for instance, I know there's been just some discussions with Gosport in the last year or two, uh, and they've taken it on, and Fair and Maruming uh, have spoken to us, uh, and we're considering it, but others, such Basin State's definite, but East Hants, we continue to do it ourselves through, through milestone so I hope that's clear thank you very much indeed Gary um I th I think I've got a, a let's see I'm scanning I'm scanning away here is it Kim who's Cal got a question yes, yes Councillor Taylor Councillor Taylor Thanks very much, Chair. I mean, really, this is a question about communication uh, from a sort of new councillor's point of point of view. Um, I mean, there are the obvious things that residents come to us about, like the potholes and the paths and all those sorts of things. And I do appreciate that there is a report reported system. Uh, I, I'll reserve my view on that because I know there's a working party probably going to be looking at, at, at that. Um, but but there are other things that we get contacted about, especially things like road safety, maybe, um, you know, can we have a new pedestrian crossing, those sorts of things. Now, I'm quite sure that, 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 that Stuart won't want us emailing him about every single thing. So I'm, I'm interested, really, in whether or not there is a, a, an etiquette, as it were, about the level at which we can discuss those things. Because... And who do we contact and what, what the process is? Because obviously not the reporting system isn't necessarily appropriate for lots of other non-pothole, broken path type things. Right, Councillor Taylor, let me step in and, and try and clarify that. Um, we would... <laughs> <laughs> odd. We would actually ask you and or all residents to contact us through the through the for our highways operations centre through that route because if you put that in, they'll look at it and they'll pass it through. So if it's a road cross, <laughs> well, I know you're shaking your head. We, okay. Perhaps I'll take that offline with you separately. <laughs> yeah. But we, um, there is you're absolutely right. We are looking to do some changes, and I'll let Stuart come in and clarify that for me in a minute. But we do ask for the majority of all inquiries to come in centrally because we vet them and we can pass them to the right person. Because otherwise, our, for instance, I get emails in direct from members it's not for me i don't mind responding letting them know and then i pass it on but it's just not it can make us inefficient and if i'm away for two or three weeks they get lost uh, and, and don't get responded to so we do ask them in, and then we will pass them to the right officer and we're quite often they're more than happy to contact you and for instance discuss how you um, and give, make you aware of how you can or cannot get uh, a pedestrian crossing put in but perhaps Stuart can come and just clarify for me 
there's a couple of people who want to come in and clarify and Stuart, Stuart uh, Jarvis does want to clarify, but Councillor Oppenheimer as the executive member also does, but I'm going to have, allow the first word to, to Stuart and then Russell, if I can do it that way round, I think that'd probably be right. Stuart, do you want to go first and then Russell? Thank you very much, Chairman, and I, I, I'll attempt, attempt to be brief. I mean, the reason that we've got the, the hop and the electronic system is that if we didn't have that, we couldn't possibly cope with the volume of inquiries that we get. Um, I'm always happy to receive emails from members. I mean, it's part of my job to work for county councillors and to support you. So you can always send me an email, but my office also triage emails. And it's actually, you'll get a quicker response by using the electronic system than sending it to anyone's individual emails. Um, what I do, you know, completely understand Councillor Teddy, you know, sometimes um, the public don't get the answers that they want. And, and you know, that, that is the way it is. Um, what we need to do is to be more professional, I think, about turning things around more quickly and getting, and getting responses more quickly. And we're working on that. Um, Councillor Oppenheimer is chairing a little group that's looking at how we improve contact for county councillors in particular with our system. So I'll let Russell say a little more about that if that's what he's going to cover, because we recognise that we need to support county councillors better. I think in the past, the, the, the system has become overwhelmed by being contacted on a kind of priority basis by parish and district councillors, as well as county councillors. And at the end of the day, highways is a county council service. And it's right that county councillors should have more say and more influence in the way that service is delivered. And that's one of the things that we're looking to try to improve. But just the sheer volume of contacts that we get would, would overwhelm us. If, if all of those go into individual offices, they'll never actually do any work. They'll spend all their time answering emails and, and phone calls from members. And, and clearly what you really want is a good service on the ground, which should hopefully reduce um, the amount of, of requests for contact. But I do, Chairman, completely understand that we need to improve our contact with for county councillors, and that's where I think Councillor Oppenheimer's working group is going to, is hopefully going to be, you know, a very helpful development in that. Yes, Councillor Oppenheimer, yes, please do tell, tell us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come in, Chairman. Um, just to endorse what Stuart said, but make a couple of other points as well. We're going to have this virtual depot visit on 30th of June, and I hope that all members of this committee will be able to attend that or at least watch the recording afterwards, because we are going to go into this very issue in a lot more detail. And there'll be a note, a two, two page guidance note for county councillors that we're going to circulate in advance of the depot visit. But Councillor Taylor raises an important question, which is what, what can county councillors do um, for their local communities when there's a specific issue? I think members can play an important role. They can be the eyes and ears for the county council. And as Stuart says, we are always looking to improve. And if there's something that's not right on the network, we do want to know about it. But importantly, I think county councillors can also explain the constraints that we are under in managing the highways and Stuart has been quite blunt with us today about the financial constraints. We have to be quite blunt with parish and town and district councillors occasionally about the constraints the county faces. So rather than always coming with emails to, to the team, um, I hope county councillors will take the message that they, they will need to push back sometimes as well. And it's really important to bear in mind that if we if we take up too much of officers time with emails, we're potentially diverting their attention away from the front line, away from getting uh, defects fixed, get away from actually improving the highways. So we, we have to be mindful of that. Um, but yes, as I say, I hope to go into this in more depth on 30th of June. Thank you, Chairman. Cut. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Oppenheim. Councillor Taylor, you've raised, uh, I think, an extremely important point. I'm sure most members would uh, would have a great deal of sympathy for the points you've raised. So do you want to come back on uh, on anything that you've heard before I invite uh, Councillor Lumby to, uh, to, to speak, because he's next? Um, I think part of the problem is, is that by the time you get involved as a councillor, whether that's a borough, and I've been a borough councillor as well, or, or indeed as a county councillor, is that um, our consumer, the resident, has already attempted to use the system and have found it wanting. So 
on individual matters that come to us from residents, that's already an escalation. Uh, and I think that currently what what uh, residents find difficult, and in, indeed I found difficult as a, as a borough councillor as well, when you use that reporting system, you may or may not get a timely response. And often the response that you get is a very standard push button response, which is pretty unintelligible um, to the average human being. You know, what does it mean when it doesn't meet safety concerns? You know, does it mean it's not 10 foot tall in terms of a pothole? Um, so I don't. I think there are there is room for improvement in the way that system works in in terms of the information and the responses that get given to to people who use it. Um, uh, and, and, and so it is frustrating. And I think what will happen is if that if, if those improvements aren't there and if, if the comments that go back to residents aren't intelligible in a normal, you know, basic everyday language, then they do come to their county councillors and to their borough county councillors to escalate. Uh, and so when some when county councillors get involved, it's already an escalation and it is already different. And therefore, just using the same reporting system isn't really appropriate. Okay, so that well, needs to be taken into account, I think. No, I, I think I think those points are extremely valid, very important. And uh, we've heard Stuart Jarvis uh, commit to working and uh, uh, with and uh, alongside Councillor Oppenheimer to do what we can to improve that uh, that service to members. Uh, time will tell how we manage to get that improved as uh, to, to the satisfaction of members. But of course, that's our job on the ETE Select Committee to ensure that we hold the executive to account, as we were hearing earlier on. So and I'm sure that you will do that and I'm sure that other colleagues will do that. But we have a commitment from the senior officers. We have a commitment from our executive members that they're addressing this matter. And uh, and I think we can uh, we can see how that progresses. So once again, I would I would echo uh, Councillor Oppenheimer's invitation there. Unfortunately, we can't visit the depots in person on the 30th of June and the, and the 1st of July. But I'm sure we'll be able to do that. I do hope so anyway, in due course. But in the meantime, we have a virtual visit on the 30th of June when these matters will be uh, will be teased out in a lot more detail and uh, and I'm sure we will return to this subject uh, again in due course. So thank you very much for raising it. Councillor, Councillor Lumby, you've been uh, very patient. This is the ca Councillor Lumby, you're going to have to consider doing something about this. I mean, this is going to cause major confusion, isn't it? Councillor, having a Councillor Lumby and a Councillor Humby. Um, really <laughs> Councillor Lumby, you're next. We're, we're Generally nervous then when you were going through the list of people and I thought, oh my God, my hand's up as well. I can't be asked to ask that question. I'm like, don't ask me to answer that one. <laughs> so I avoided that one. So that was good. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you to everybody for um, all the presentations. Just a, a couple of, I think, hopefully simple questions and much, much um, a different grade to, to Councillor Taylor's question. Firstly, um, on the economic development presentation, I noticed there was uh, no reference to um, ensuring we equip um, people with the, the relevant skills and training they need to take advantage of, uh, for example, the free ports and the other opportunities as we develop. Um, and I'm assuming that that therefore sits somewhere else with the council and I'm interested to know how, how, how that is dealt with and how um, the teams work together, perhaps as a sort of example of how it, how it happens. Uh, and secondly, um, I thought the, the figures for uh, Junction 10 on, on the N27 and the fact that it had a dedicated officer working on it were, were pretty stark. I mean, there were lots of very stark figures for that one in particular. Um, and I really would, would like to know, and it, it's not to be told now, but really going forward, um, are we going to be learning more about that? Are the groups giving specific oversight to that? What, what's the plan on Junction 10? Because it's A, an awful lot of money, and B, it will have a major impact on the hinterland around it, which I declare a vested interest on me in because I represent a good part of it. So th those are two questions of a major. Yes, thank you for that, Councillor Lumby. I, I don't want to open up the issue of Junction 10 of the M27 at this juncture under this meeting. However, however, you, you, we have got on the next item on the agenda with the work programme, 
we'll be going into that just in a, not in too much detail, but outlining where you stand and uh, as a member, where we all stand as members in terms of bringing matters which we feel are important to the select committee for consideration and further examination. And so you're in a position there to promote whichever uh, subject that you think is important at that, at that uh, under that uh, uh, format of the work program. So I would I would encourage you to use the work program to do that uh, where you feel that that's that's appropriate. Uh, you mentioned free ports, and I I, I have to say Richard uh, in his, Richard Kenny in his presentation did mention free ports there. Whether he wants to say anything about that, I don't know. He's got his hand up. Uh, but I also noticed that Rob Humby also has his hand up. So I'm going to ask Rob Humby first and then Richard Kenny to come in and answer some of the questions that you've raised. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Clearly, I let Richard talk about the free port. So it's just a comment on the skills and training, and I know Richard will comment on that as well. Um, Councillor Ros Chad is the exec member for Children's Service and Education. I literally had a conversation with her yesterday about joining up some of the economic development team with skills and training and her remit with the with the um, with the colleges and the universities as well so we are going to bring that together more as, as she sort of sits in a new role as well it's a really good question but i'll let richard comment on the three ports on, on, on that as well thank you mr chairman yeah th th thank you chairman um yeah ju ju just to say quickly on the on the on the skills point um we, we we do work and meet regularly with the skills people to to make that join up we work on a monthly we meet on a monthly basis if not more frequently um, and, and on things like the community renewal bids, which skills um, and employment has been a key theme. Um, we've been working very closely with the skills colleagues, but, but you're absolutely right. I think, you know, the question is right in terms of its direction. Um, skills is a key part of the, of, of, the, of, of, of the economy and the retention of talent and the development and creation of talent is fundamental for us moving forwards. I suppose the other thing to mention that's really very important is the point about collaborating too with the local enterprise partnerships that are doing a great deal of work on skills um, as well as individually and, and locally what's happening in the colleges and and as Rob mentioned in terms of higher education so there is a real need to you know to to draw that together so that you know we we, we make the most of um, of all the different activities and we're not fragmenting or creating um, or duplicating but actually we're, we're 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 working closely together to 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 make the benefits of that actually happen um just on the freeport bid um skills is a is an integral part of of the freeport bid um and the, the 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 innovation hub that sits centrally in terms of the the, the freeport proposal so so linking some of the developments around innovation and, and decarbonisation linked to the, the Green Growth Institute, which is a which is something that is being developed where different parts of the higher education sector and the further education colleges are coming together to work through what that Green Growth Institute could do, collaborating across the Freeport proposals. So I think it will be a key a key part um, of, of, of those developments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Uh, uh, Hugh, do you want to come back on any of those points? Uh, no, that, that 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 was very helpful and very useful. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Members, I, I don't have or I cannot see anyone else uh, wishing to ask any questions. So I'm going to draw uh, uh, item three, therefore, to a close and uh, and thank the officers again for their presentations, which uh, which will be available, uh, are available to you on the ModGov. Uh, and uh, and I would uh, I would certainly recommend that uh, from time to time you have a look at those again and uh, and, and read through them because I think there's some extremely useful uh, information there for all members. So the next item on the agenda is the work program. Now uh, the work program was uh, touched on by Katie in her presentation earlier on, but just uh, just for clarity, the the constitution uh, of the county council. Uh, uh, deals with and addresses the issues of the work program and it says and I quote from the constitution it says select committees will be responsible for proposing their own work program of activities within their planned meeting structure 
and uh, and if you if you get the opportunity to uh, to have a look at so Katie was mentioning it earlier that's part three chapter three of the constitution at 1.9.1 for instance it says that any member of the select committee shall be entitled to give notice to the chief executive that they wish an item relevant to the function of the committee or subcommittee to be included on the agenda for the next convenient meeting. On receipt of such request, the chief executive will ensure that it is so included. So the, the uh, constitution of the uh, council gives you members a great deal of autonomy and uh, authority and rights in terms of bringing what you want to the, uh, to the uh, floor or uh, the committee for the committee to determine. Now, I have no right of veto. I don't want a right of veto as, as chairman. I can't uh, rule out anything that, uh, that members would want to place before the, uh, the ETE Select Committee. But of course, we've heard from the presentations this morning that the, uh, uh, that the remit of the committee is extraordinarily vast and wide ranging. So the only thing I would, I would request members uh, when you're considering bringing matters to the ET Select Committee for inclusion in the work programme is that you uh, bear in mind, if I could ask you, to bear in mind the resource implication that there are for the officers the, uh, and the uh, purpose for which you want to bring that item to the ET Select Committee. I'm not saying that in any uh, in any um, instructional or lecturing way, it's merely a request on my part to ask that you do consider that in advance, because the those members who have been members of the select committee for longer, uh, indeed longer than me, will realise and I'm sure appreciate and agree that the select committee works much better when it's focused on, on key items, on certain key items that are of great importance, rather than a whole range uh, and a vast number of items which uh, which are just going to send us on hoovering up officer time uh, and so on. So that's not that's not me being, uh, as I say, hectoring. It's just a request from me uh, as the chair. Now I said earlier on that we have a blank canvas for the uh, for the for the work program. Uh, there were items previously. Uh, under consideration by the previous committee, but we have a lot of new members, including a lot of new, brand new members to the county council. So I don't think you should necessarily be be shackled with the uh, with, with the the uh, commitments or the desires of previous committee. Uh, the previous committee, you can revisit those if you wish to, but this is your opportunity. I'll give you an opportunity now to raise any matters that you think you might want to see the select committee discuss and go into more detail at future meetings. In addition to that, however, and I think it is important to mention, it doesn't have to be at the forum of the ETE select committee that you raise these matters. You can raise any matter that you wish that you think the ETE select committee should be looking at on the work program at any time, at any time. So if uh, five minutes, five hours, five days or five weeks down the line, something occurs to you or something crops up and you feel that that's something that you would like to like place before the ET Select Committee, then by all means, under the Constitution, you can contact myself, if you wish, the chief executive, the executive members, or probably preferably include all of those in any emails that you send and, uh, and make, that, make such a request. So really, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's over to you. Uh, if anybody wants to raise any issues now for inclusion in the work in, in a future work program uh, uh, for this uh, for the ETE committee. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I make one final point? I'm sorry to put my hand up on that. I completely and absolutely agree with everything uh, that you said. The select committee is there to uh, to challenge us and, and scrutinise uh, the work of the exec as well. But I did just note, see the note that Stuart has put in the chat. It's worth also noting, just keeping an eye on what other things are coming up in terms of timescales, whether that's legal timescales, there's a challenge there, or, or what it is, it's coming to cabinet or it's going to council. So obviously we don't want to be doubling up on things. That's not trying to restrict it in any way, like you said previously, 
but making suggestions and then a conversation with yourself and maybe Stuart and exec members just the looking at timing of things can prove very useful sometimes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Humby. I think you put that far better than I did. I tried to, that was what I was trying to say, but I, I'm, I'm glad you came in and, and uh, made that point. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Kyle. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Uh, and uh, uh, I just would like to um, put forward that uh, maybe the uh, uh, Select Committee might want to look at um, managing uh, highway works on on our highway network and the reason i'm asking this planned and otherwise that's by utility companies but also uh, obviously by our our own uh, operatives um and it's sort of the coordination of of that in effect and how that's managed and i know that was mentioned in one of the uh, presentations that we had earlier um i know that uh, other members in effect actually but also specifically myself uh, in my division have had some very recent uh, issues with regards to uh, emergency works on the highway with road closure, but also planned uh, road closure um, uh, road closure issues and works, um, and and the sort of ensuing chaos that that has actually caused, um, which has taken up quite a lot of officer time as well as as I'm very much very well aware. And I was just wondering whether or not there was uh, an opportunity here for the select committee to actually uh, look at, shall we say, the policies and procedures in effect with regards to this. Um, and whether there's maybe any recommendations that we might want to put forward uh, to look at those policies um, in a little bit more depth, shall we say, because I know that it's caused uh, quite a lot of consternation and problems within my local area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Carr. Um, I've got Councillor Hughes next. Um, thank you, Chairman. I would be grateful if um, the economic development team could actually give us a presentation that details the the benefits and potential consequences of the free ports. <clears throat> and I say that because if they, are, if they have tax-free status, how far does that tax uh, freedom extend? Does it extend into business rates, VAT, et cetera, which could have a knock-on impact on our local economies. So I'd be interested to have that uh, information. Thank you very much, Councillor Hughes. Would you, do you think on, on raising that point, do you think it might be uh, worthwhile if, uh, if an invitation perhaps on that matter were extended to somebody from the uh, Solent LEP, for instance, uh, because I know the Solent LEP have been leading strongly with that too. I, I have no in, uh, inclination one way or the other. It's, I'm more interested in the best source of the information to help us understand far better what Solent Port, uh, what the free ports bring to us as a, as a county. Understand. Fair point. R Richard, do you want to come back on on the point there? Yeah. Yeah. Please, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, yeah. We'd be very happy to do that, and we could we could do a joint presentation if that was if that would work. All all, all I would say is that um, it, it's still very early stages in terms of working through the negotiations and the detailed business case um, with with government. So whilst the government approved the Solent Freeport bid and the application which made its case, you know, that it would generate 3 billion GVA, 2 billion worth of private sector investment and 52,000 jobs. We haven't worked through, you know, what that means in terms of actually the individual tax sites being moved forward, the individual custom sites being moved forward. And as was rightly said, there are a whole raft of issues around the added value and the the displacement issues and the, the the dead weight and everything else that goes into those site specific issues. So we, we would be more than happy to do a presentation on the Freeport proposals. A lot of it, uh, a lot of the detail is not worked through yet at this stage and won't be worked through until the autumn, but we would be happy to do that. Um, and, and also the government is insisting that a lot of that detail is confidential until <laughs> The government reaches its its position on um, that that finer detail and improves both the outline business case and the full business case. Just one final thing to say is that the person who's leading the business case development for Councillor Oppenheimer had already made a suggestion when chairman of previous chairman of the committee to uh, to have verge maintenance looked at. Can I just ask a question of uh, Stuart Jarvis briefly, uh, Stuart? Um, it has been uh, mentioned as part of the proposed work programme by Councillor Oppenheimer when he chaired this committee previously that verge maintenance be considered and it was it was uh, pencilled in potentially for this meeting in June. 
Uh, has there been a sufficient amount of work done so far on that uh, matter that uh, could uh, could perhaps expedite verge maintenance as a as a report that could come before members in a in reasonably short time frame, possibly even the July meeting, or is that too soon? And, and we've certainly done some work, Chairman, on it, and I I'm, will consult my colleagues afterwards. But I, I'm kind of reasonably confident that we would be in a position to bring a paper forward, which sort of basically shows the changes that we've made and what what we believe the outcome of that is. And and it's effectively, you know, I think as Councillor um, Adams King said, you, you, you effectively divide people in half. With those that we could leave the verges alone because it's good for wildfires versus the experts that say no mowing them when you're mowing them is the best thing for you know promoting future wildfire growth um, and we are spending an awful lot of officer time as uh, i appreciate um council adams king's point you know there's a lot of correspondence coming in about this trying to explain our position so i'm sure it would be um you know a useful information exchange issue I, I do think that's a separate issue from the one councillor Mellor was talking about you know about kind of encroachment on verges with parking and things like that this this, this is basically talking about the verge cutting regime it um, is it is yes and, and chairman i know you're fully aware of this but we also have agency arrangements with with district councils for verge cutting and a number of the district councils augment the verge cutting program that the county council funds by doing extra cuts and again i'm aware that there's correspondence for and against that in urban areas particularly where you tend typically to get more verge cut so um i think there are a range of issues and i'm sure at the very least we could bring a paper forward that sort of brought members up to speed on a number of those things and, and there certainly be enough material for a, a debate, I would have thought. Excellent. OK, thank you for that. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate that. Um, OK, Councillor Councillor Dun uh, Dunning, I think you're next. Is that right? I'm I, th I think I am. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to agree with uh, Councillor Mellor on his concerns about parking, etc. Obviously, I'm from Lymington, so I'm very much in, in, involved with that. And uh, we have lots of uh, our groups um, are very negative about it, i.e. our Chamber of Commerce, our Lymington Pennington Town Council and indeed Boulder Parish Council as well, who've come out against it. Um, so I'd, I'd very much like to be involved with that working group, if I could, um, to review the whole thing, if that'd be OK. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And just to remind uh, to remind you, Councillor Dunning, the Council of Oppenheimer is uh, it has a paper on that this afternoon. So and I'm looking at the time and I'm I'm aware that they do have another meeting to go to and I want them to get a, at least to get a, a bite to eat before that. So we'll try and move on as quickly as we possibly can. I understand, Councillor Crawford, uh, you've you've you wanted to raise a point. Councillor Crawford. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I, I just as I was about to speak before my for the first time, this new device uh, dropped off. So unfortunately, I missed my opportunity. Um, I was very taken with the presentation of uh, Richard Kenny about the, the benefits of economic and sustainable development. Um, what I've had recently since I was elected is a, a lot of comment locally about the drag on this of the cutbacks in road and uh, um, pothole maintenance and so on. It does seem to me that perhaps uh, there could be some more detailed analysis done about the benefits of maintaining um, uh, road maintenance uh, expenditure at a higher level. And I wondered if that could be something that was done because all I've seen so far is uh, almost like a note of regret that there's been 12 million pounds cut off the budget, but no real analysis from what I've seen of the damaging effect of this going forward if this kind of approach continues because they're going in opposite directions investing in economic and, and sustainable development and cutting back on roads uh, maintenance and repair i i, cer I certainly understand entirely what you're saying managing the highway network and i believe uh, uh, that has that has been previously put forward i if I recollect correctly, it was Councillor Hughes wanted to, to, to see something on uh, managing the highway network. Uh, Councillor Hughes, do you recall? I think he's left the meeting, Chairman. Left the meeting. Apologies to put it, try and put him on the spot, but uh, but I believe he I believe he raised that in the past. 
But uh, what we'll do is we'll 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 make a note of that too, Councillor Crawford. I think that is an extremely important matter. I mean, it probably is difficult to imagine a more important matter. Councillor Humby. Yeah, Mr Chairman, if I may, it's sort of in terms of how this process is working. I think I understand why there's lots of questions and lots of answers. Normally, your select committee wouldn't have this whole range of officers. This is about deciding what's going to be on the work programme. So rather than drop those questions straight to the officers now, putting stuff on the work programme, I understand members will want to give their reasons for that, but you've almost gone into debating the subject as if it was a select committee now. So I'm just trying to help the process and also help the officer team that could come back with a much fuller response and prepare it when it goes to the select committee. So I would suggest, Mr Chairman, if I may, that you just take the headlines of what you'd like on there you have those discussions potentially with Stuart, decide on the on the timings of those when appropriate, and then officers prepare a response at the appropriate select committee. Do you know, I, I absolutely agree. Thank you, Councillor Humby. I, I quite agree with that. I didn't, I didn't intend to get into any detail, but the uh, inclusion and the fortuitous inclusion of the officers in this meeting on this occasion, and it is a, specially, uh, a special occasion because it's not actually a full meeting of the committee, gave us an opportunity then, at least on a couple of those points that members have raised, for the officers to come in and say, well, actually, on, say, for example, the Environment Bill, on, say, for instance, uh, other matters, that it might be better to wait until we see what happens a lot further down the line. So actually, it was quite useful to get that, because otherwise we'll uh, we have a bit of a traffic jam of, uh, of items coming up for our work programme. But I completely understand the point you're making. I do want to try and stick to, to headlines, and uh, and that is my that is my intention, that is my aim. Uh, but of course, having so many excited new members at the committee, and with so much information that's been coming out from these excellent presentations, it was almost inevitable, I guess, inviting people to uh, to make comments that I was going to get a lot of comments. But I uh, never. I welcome the new members' enthusiasm, Chairman. So do I. So do I. Councillor Lumby. That was a, an effortless segue into an excited new member. Very good, Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it's really a question. I, I, I've got various things I'd like to um, bring up, but I'm going to, um, if it's OK, raise those with um, Stuart and yourself and the um, relevant executive members separately and then sort of see where that will kick, kick it around a bit before bringing it forward, if I may. But just a question of clarity. Um, Stuart very helpfully um, mentioned that the Junction 10 there was a paper coming to Cabinet on that um, in July. Just just to understand, and maybe it's one for Casey, do these things automatically go to, to this committee as well, um, before or after, um, or do we need to go through the agendas and pull things out for, for consideration? I just, um, it was probably covered earlier on and I, I failed to fully taken on board. Oh, I see. OK, uh, well, what we're dealing with at the moment is the work programme. So I, I appreciate that. And I, I've just used that as an opportunity to ask the question. That I'm in, in, sneaking in. in, a, in a, I don't know whether Stuart Jarvis wants to just uh, just to come in there, just to explain that that in briefly how pre scrutiny and uh, and other issues like that work. Stuart, do you want to just say a thing or two? I'll do my best, Chairman. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what we try to do as the officer team in consultation with the exec members is if there's a substantive item coming forward that would be within our sort of remit, um, then we would tend to suggest to the select committee that they may wish to either have a briefing about it or include a pre-scrutiny on a paper. Um, something like Junction 10 Council of Lumber, you know, has been looked at in the past as a principle. Um, that the, the paper that's going to cabinet is very much around a kind of financial decision about whether the county council takes on the role and does that work. So that would not be the kind of issue that we would normally put forward as a suggested pre-scrutiny. And because it was going to cabinet, the pre-scrutiny would probably be the PNR select committee rather than the ETE one as well. Um, but, but for example, if it, you know, in the early days of looking at the kind of Ferrum and Gospel access strategy, then that would have been the type of issue that would have been brought forward, you know, when a number of schemes were being looked at and the overall kind of benefits of Stemmington Bypass, improving the A27, um, Newgate Lane, North and South and things like that. 
And so we, we try to bring stuff forward at an early kind of policy development formulation stage so that the select committee can sort of influence the direction of travel rather than necessarily bring forward detailed things like project appraisals for scrutiny. Because by then, you know, you're pretty much into this is how, how much it's going to cost, this is how it's going to be funded, rather than the principle of whether you were going to make that sort of intervention or not. And I, I hope that's helpful. But of course, as the chairman outlined, it is for members to decide if they wish to um, do stuff. And that's why the county council publishes the forward plan of decisions, which are due to be made so that members, all members have got the opportunity to see what's coming up and, and you know, see if they wish to suggest that being looked at um, act, proactively pre-scrutinised. I, I think it's also fair to say, uh, uh, ca Councillor Councilor Lumby, that if there are matters that you would specific matters that are being discussed at a decision day, uh, if, particularly if they're non-key decisions, I'm quite certain that if you give uh, notice in advance to the executive member, if you wish to attend the, that decision day and speak at the decision day, then I, my 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 experience is that executive members will accommodate you in that in that matter uh, and that doesn't necessarily require the whole thing then to come before the scrutiny committee for for a uh, investigation or determination is is that a, a fair enough answer that that that, no, that that's very helpful it was um almost a, you know trying to work out what things should we put it put put forward here what things go automatically what the other routes were, and that that's been very useful clarity. So thank you very much indeed. No, thank you, thank you. I have no further speakers, members. So we're we're we. I can now draw to the meeting to a close and say that it's been an unusual meeting. We it's it's not the it's not normally uh, in this format, but I have to say that I'm very grateful to not only all of you members for attending, but all of the executive members for attending too. And also, of course, to the officers and their and their presentations, which I, as I said before, I thought were absolutely excellent. Katie, thank you very much for keeping the whole thing on the road. I do appreciate that too. That's very helpful for me. Now, I have called uh, an extraordinary meeting for the reasons I mentioned earlier on the 29th of July. That should take some of the pressure off of the meeting again as well on the 23rd of September scheduled. So our next meeting is on the 29th of July. The, uh, the constitution, as well as the legislation, I believe, means that we must make that meeting in person. Hopefully, fingers crossed, the, uh, the restrictions will have been lifted sufficiently for us to be able to meet in person in, in a much more, inverted commas, normal way. So can I thank you all for your attendance? I look forward to seeing you all in person on the 29th of July. And, uh, and some of you, perhaps for the decision day, I'll be sitting in on and listening to this afternoon. OK, thank you very much, for members. I declare thank the you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Well done, mate. Cheers.